Welcome everyone. This is going to be a game changing interview. I am so, 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 so excited about this one because I get to unpack the brain of someone who pulled off something that I don't even know if five firms in the United States plaintiff facing have pulled this off. Mike Morse, I'm going to be interviewing today. He's built a nine figure law firm from scratch and just speechless what he's pulled off in his state becoming the omnipresent force, the household name in his state. And I am super excited about this interview. So thank you for taking the time, Mike. Oh, I'm super excited to be here, Bill. So Mike just wrote a book called Fireproof. So why don't we show everyone the book before we dive in? There's the book. Mike said he got, uh, he's getting his first handful of the book was life-changing responses. So make sure before we go dive into the weeds, you guys pick up his book on Amazon, right, Mike? Yes. Cool. Yeah. Amazon, you know, and I'm actually in the process of uh, doing an audible uh, copy. I did my first half of the book this week. I had lots of people who don't like to read anymore. They like to listen. I'm a reader. I don't listen. And so I'm, I'm in the process of recording it, which is another story, but it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. Unbelievable. I think the impressive thing here is, you know, Mike is running a nine figure law firm and he still can find time to record an audio version of a book that he just spent months writing. So that is so impressive to me. So Mike, my, my first question is like, what the heck is going on in your head and, and, and your habits and, and your life to, to pull off building a, not, you know, not stopping at seven or eight figures, but nine figures still with huge growth goals. What don't other lawyers have that you have going on in your life that's making you so motivated to build such an amazing firm? You know, it's never, ever, ever been about money. And except for when I was a young kid. So in my book, I talk about how I used to make money to protect myself. I thought it was gonna protect me from the bullies, from the bad step parents, from boredom, from whatever it is. I was making money, paper routes and busing tables and waiting tables and, and, then, and then it just translated. Once I became a lawyer, it was kind of, it became a game and the money started coming in. And I, you know, I never wanted a 150 person law firm. I never wanted a nine figure firm. That was never one of my goals. I set goals as you set goals. I hear you talk about goals all the time. I set goals every day. It's never, I've never set a money goal. I mean, we set money goals as far as settlements in the firm and, and things like that, but never personal income. That was never a goal. Uh, the money has always come because I'm doing good work and I'm, I'm winning cases and it just, it just comes and it just kept coming and I kept growing. And so, you know, there was never a focus on just making money. But I'll tell you, if you do the five steps that are in my book, you will be freed up to write a book. You'll be freed up to record a book. You'll be freed up to spend as much time as you want with your family and your kids. You'll be freed up to work on exactly what you want to work on. So through this process, I've been, I've had lots of lawyers call me. I had a lawyer yesterday call me from San Diego, said the book changed his life. He wants to meet me. He wants to talk to me. And he loves trying cases. He, he doesn't want to do anything else but try cases. And I said, follow these five steps and all you'll do is try cases. And he doesn't believe it. He's going to try it. We're, we're going to work on some coaching and, and things like that with him. But, you know, that wasn't my goal. My goal is I wanted to run a great law firm. I wanted to work on the areas that I love to work in, that I'm great at. And I wanted enough free time to be with my three daughters, travel the world, play some golf, write a book, talk to you, do things like that. So um, I, him and I have different things. Now I've been doing this a little bit longer than him. Um, and so everybody's different. Like every single person listening to this, every single person who's listening to my book is gonna have a different list of where their sweet spot is, right? Where their unique ability is. You've talked about that on a dozen podcasts I've watched for years. And that's my goal too, is to have everybody, every lawyer working in that sweet spot. The problem is every single person listening to this podcast is doing 100, 200, 300 things as I was before I came up with this system. And you can't do everything. You can't run a law firm every single thing, soup to nuts. You can't do it and handle cases and try cases and market and advertise and spend time with your family and, and, and. You know it, you know it. You coach on this, you talk about this. So this is a, a system that we followed. We didn't write this system to write a book. 
we, we lived this system for 12 or 13 years. And, you know, someone said to me, hey, you should share this with the world. And I'm like, oh, that's a pretty good idea. So I did. And we're having, this is just fun. You know, I'm not making money off $20 books. This yeah. is just, this is just fun. It's, uh, it's teaching. This is just fun for me. And so it's, uh, it's interesting. It's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? So you're, you're at the top self-actualization piece of, of that that triangle, right? Where you're doing things out of choice rather than necessity. I Two things that come through my mind, I'm in some high level masterminds, uh, one of them with Mike Mogul of Chris Video. And um, I have two things that are popping in my mind right now. Number one is the question, is hard work the only contributor to success? Because it doesn't seem to me like you're working too hard right now. The other one is courage. So let's talk about, let's talk about the hard work side. It is, is hard work the key to this puzzle that you've constructed with your firm? Nobody worked harder than me for the first 25 years of my practice. And I feel like I've been working hard since law school, right? Law school and clerking and then working my butt off to get a case and working my ass off to, to win the cases. Because if you don't have a good foundation, if you don't win, if you're not a great lawyer, if the clients don't love you, if the public doesn't love you, if referring attorneys don't love you, then you're, then you're done, right? I mean, that's obvious, but that doesn't come easy. I mean, I worked my ass off and yeah, the la I'm now reaping the rewards of that, but I'm still working hard, but I'm enjoying what I'm doing, right? So I'm still teaching my lawyers every day. I'm mentoring them. I'm taking on different projects. I'm working on a case right now. I spent five hours this morning reading uh, through a file where I'm going to try to help an innocent man get out of prison. Okay. doesn't have anything to do with auto ac accidents or truck accidents, does it? But I'm giving back to the world. I'm giving back to my firm. Um, that's what I want to do right now. And I'm doing it. And yeah, I had a golf lesson this morning too, in between all that, Bill. Right. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I've set up my firm in such a way that my clients are going to be happy with what I've done. So if my clients are listening to this, I'm not embarrassed because uh, they, they have the best representation they can get. I have 40 lawyers who are killing it. And I talk about how I hire my lawyers and they're the best lawyers and maybe they're better than me, but I make sure that I hire people better than me. And I have a COO above them who's making sure that everything on their files are getting done. We have auditors, we have people making sure that the witness lists are on time. We like to call it that the trains are running on time and everything's running on time without me being in the office every second of every day. So, and if there's a problem, I also talked to three clients this morning. And on the, on the way to my golf lesson, on the way home, I talked to clients who are having issues, who don't, don't understand a settlement. So I'm still working hard, but I'm having fun. So it's hmm. not like, yeah, I'm not at my office. I'm no longer going to Costco to make sure that we have paper in the, in the, in the, in the copy machines. I'm no longer ordering postage. I'm not making sure we have the right coffee. I'm not uh, doing all of that stuff that I used to do. Yeah. I have a team of advertisers, of digital marketers. Like I have 150 people, but I also have a lot of uh, outside people who are, who are helping me. So I'm working smarter, not harder, I think. And okay. um, so I, and I didn't take offense to you saying it doesn't look like I'm working that hard because that's what I want you to think. Right? Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, yeah, I'm not reading, uh, I'm not handling every auto case in my office anymore, yeah. but I'm surely making sure that my 40 lawyers are handling them better than I would have handled them. That's my goal. Yeah. Whether they're better than me or not, that's something that, you know, we could debate, but we're not selling 150, $160 million worth of cases every year uh, because I took my foot off the pedal. In fact, they know that, you know, we're on it. Hard work is a, it's a good question. And I, 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 I do think I work hard, but I think I've worked hard setting up the system and the processes that you've mm -hmm. talked about. And I'm setting my goal and I'm spending the best time of my week, Bill, is my 90 minute executive team meeting every Tuesday morning at 830 in the morning, no matter what country I'm in, no matter what city I'm in, I talk to my seven other executives. We we're now doing Zoom calls. It used to be in person. Mm -hmm. And I learn everything from where my jumbotron is and all my data to all the issues that we, that we make sure that we do in that meeting to, did everybody do their 10 to 20 to do's that they were supposed to do from the last meeting? Like I'm on it, mm -hmm. but 
when I'm on it, like this system and process, I don't have to work 80, 90 hour weeks in my business. Yeah. I can work 10 or 20 on my business. I know, know, I know you know exactly what I'm talking about, yep. uh, being a traction and EOS supporter mm -hmm. and you know, whatever, whatever the term is, you know, yeah, a follower. The, the, um, yeah, the, the, the on the business was from Michael Gerber. Here's an interesting thing. I feel there's so much guilt in business owners where they feel like they have to be the hardest working person in the company. And it's funny because the reason I asked that question is because I hired a guy once he legitimately worked harder than me. He was in the office later. He was in the office earlier than me. He worked every weekend. Nothing was ever good enough. And he completely burned himself out and drugged down a lot of the team. And it ended up not being a good mutual fit working with him. He's probably better as a business owner on his own. And I don't know what he's doing now, but the point is the reason I asked that question is because there's something, there's something in you that is different than hard work, that there's, there's an X factor in there that is allowing you to constantly analyze, well, what's the next highest value task? And what's the next highest value task? And I think that that barrier where people can't think about their thinking from a meta perspective and, and constantly question the fact that you're listening to my podcast as a 28 year old shows the fact that you are in a constant learning mindset. You don't care the sources of your information or, or, or surface level stuff like that. You're just always seeking new information. I guess the thing I'm trying to understand before I ask you about the courage side of the equation is I think it's okay. I don't think Warren Buffett works that hard. He makes what? He says he makes two to three good decisions a year. That's, that's all he really needs. The rest right. of the time is making the right decision, get, gathering the right information, making sure he has the right team. So where is that balance beam for you? Where, where is the work slash making sure you're focused on the right work balance? Because a lot of lawyers just focus on the hard work part and then they end up 70 years old without anything for all their hard work. Right. You know, we're talking about really an entrepreneurial mindset. And I do a lot of studying on that and researching and Gino's new book, Entrepreneurial Leap, I read even though I don't need to read. Why I keep learning, why I keep watching your podcast, why I like listening to thought leaders, because I know I don't know everything. And I love learning. I love reading. I don't know why I have that in me. I, I, nobody's ever asked me that. What I have thought about, Bill, and I don't have an answer. You don't have, you don't have kids yet? Do you have kids yet? No. So, you know, I know a lot of entrepreneurs started trying to make money at 10 years old, whether it be selling bubble gum out of their lockers or, or being a paper route. I begged my dad for a job at 13, 14 years old. I didn't need the money. Nobody told me to go get a job, but I begged him to get me a job. Um, I had three jobs at 15. I was riding my motor scooter to work and my mom would pick me up at 11 o'clock at night and follow me home. I mean, why? My kids don't have that drive. Now we've debated, is it because they have a lip, because they were raised a little bit differently and maybe we had a little bit more money than my parents did. I don't know what drives certain people. I think you gotta go back and look at people's childhood. I think you gotta, you know, entrepreneurs don't make up that much of the society. I mean, I, I don't think, and, and I think most lawyers aren't entrepreneurs. Most lawyers I've met are not entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. I don't know what percentage your clients are because, you know, mm -hmm. the clients who are turn, tuning into your podcasts might be more entrepreneurial. They, they may have realize they, they have a spark. They might be realizing they have a problem. But my experience is 90% of the lawyers have no clue. In fact, the lawyer I talked to yesterday, I do a little test. You know, they tell me, what's, I said, what are your pain points? What can I help you with? What are your pressure points? And I said, Great. I said, how many cases did you sign up last week? And there's always a pause. Well, how many last month? And there was a pause. Well, how much last year? How much, you know, what's your, uh, how, what's your average fee? There was a pause. You know, th so th these people, you know, they're realizing, they're taking the first step by calling you, by watching your podcast, by, 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 by reading my book. That's a good sign. And then they're going to, then they learn, they, they read this, it's like, holy shit, a jumbotron. I need myself a jumbotron. And, and, and light bulbs go off. And maybe that's their first spark. 90% mm. of the lawyers are running around like chickens with their head cut off, going from case to case to case. Most of them decent lawyers. Most mm. of them good lawyers. But at the end of the day, they have no idea how much money they have to pay. They have no idea what cases are making them money. They have no idea how to run an office, how to hire, how to fire, how to market, how to advertise. And 
you know, what, and, and most of them die that way. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they, you know, my dad was like that. My dad was an attorney for, for 20 years and, and he was not entrepreneurial, but he was a great lawyer. He made a very modest living. He never talked to me about this stuff. Um, he taught me how to be a good lawyer and he taught me how to treat people well and, and uh, how to be liked by judges and all, all that. But he was not entrepreneurial. He'd freak out mm-hmm. if he was still alive uh, uh, seeing what I've done um, because it's, it was, he was a single practitioner with a secretary. Mm-hmm. That's it. And, and, and you know, I, I guarantee you a lot of your clients have two, three, most law firms are two, three, four people. That's mm-hmm. it. A lot of solos. They're not these 10, 20, 30, 50. I mean, those are few and far between the big silk stocking firms that we read about, but those aren't, those are the minority. Once you get past, let's say four employees, I think the challenge is it requires you to look within yourself to your deficiencies. And one thing I'm, I'm noticing in you is nowhere do I sense this ego bravado that it's, it's so interesting. You'd think with all the billboards you have and the huge name recognition you've built up, you would, you would be in, in, a, in a world of always seeking to confirm that you're right. And Jeff Bezos says one of his, his fourth leadership principle at Amazon is uh, his leaders are right a lot. So it's it, are right, comma, a lot. And that's, that's his fourth leadership principle. And what that means is the best leaders at Amazon uh, are always seeking to disconfirm their previously deep-seated beliefs rather than just confirm them. And I think that there's so much mental resistance that you have to overcome once you get past four employees. Like I started this company two and a half years ago and I already have 15 employees with no business experience. And, and I, the one thing I would say that, that some people say I got rose colored glasses on or some people criticize it and think I'm too open-minded. Um, but the one thing that I think I always come back to, which I sense right now from you is, could I be wrong? And if so, who can I find that has my answer? Um, and that has always been the best move for me is, is, wait a second, I don't need to become the expert here. Who can I find? And then it, it leads to that courage question, which I have. And, but hold know, on, before you go to courage, go ahead. you're bringing up a very interesting and good point. And, and I think for your listeners and for you being 28, what I sense in you is a lot of curiosity. You know, we both have an innate uh, something in our brains that we want to learn. We don't have huge egos. We, we know that there's people better, smarter than us. Um, and, and, you know, you let your guests talk um, on your podcasts and you elicit good answers. There's a lot of, you know, you, you've, I don't know how many seminars you, you if you, if you're on the seminar circuit, yeah. I love seminars. Me too. And, and I love just sitting there and soaking it up. And, we, I, you know, like I went, my last one, it changed, it changed my life. Uh, at, at, at 51, 52 years old, um, I started a very, I started a podcast after listening to Gary V. I've done 65 episodes. We've got almost 2 million downloads. And wow. I sit there and I just take notes. And I take pages and pages of notes. And I don't, it's not about, I don't, it's not about money. It's not about, uh, I, I don't know what it, you know, I don't have my exact wording, what it is. Uh, but I'm, I'm still curious. I still love to learn. I know that I don't know everything. Um, and, you know, when I give a speech and I've been giving lots of uh, talks and speeches, I want people to leave way smarter than they got into the room. And you know, when you go to one of these seminars, when somebody's talking at you, when somebody's saying, you know, I could explain to you how to handle this type of case, but you're better off referring it to me. Well, lots of people speak to get referrals. I speak not, not to get referrals. Sometimes they come. Sometimes, um, you know, it, it, it benefits me, but that's not why I do it. And, and if you have that mindset that you're just going to put out all this content and good things are going to happen, kind of like what you're doing for all your podcasts, you're not, I have not heard you say once really hire me. You're giving, 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 and you're going to get clients from that. And I kind of do the same. And, you know, my commercials, all my com- competitors are asking for the sale, asking for the sale. I'm entertaining them. Um, a lot. If you, if you go watch my commercials, I want them to laugh. I want them to have fun. 
they know what I do for a living. And I have, when I'm, when we used to go out and about, I'd have five, six, seven people come up to me and say, I love your commercials. I love your commercials. I promise you, there's a hundred lawyers on TV watching this. None of them will say people come up to them and say, I love your commercials. Why? Because attorney commercials generally suck. Yeah. And uh, they all suck in my market. And um, I decided that's not what I was going to do. So I have people say, well, you're not asking for the sale. You're, you know, you, they know what I do. I, yeah. you know, I'm shooting some fun commercials this weekend that I'll, I'll send you um, having to do with masks and things. And, and yeah. it's for fun. I'm not going to be asking for a sale and I'm spending a lot of money to make it. But yeah. I think that people come up to me. We've done surveys. We've done focus groups. Why do you call Mike? He's approachable. He's likable. I like his mom. He does have a big ego. And, I, and you know what? You can't fake that shit. Yeah. And, and my competitors can't copy me. I can tell the whole world what I'm doing. I, my commercials are on my YouTube channel. They can't, it can't be, you can't fake it. Yeah. So I'm not worried about the competition. I'm not worried. So that's, let me, I'm not worried. People say to me all the time, why are you giving away your trade secrets? Yeah. Why are you, why'd you write the book? That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Right? No, it's not. Okay. This is, this is, this makes me happy to share my, my, my secrets. And I'm not worried that my competitors are going to pick it up and take over because they can't fake it. 99% of the people won't follow these five steps. 99% of people won't create a jumbotron, yep. uh, but the ones who will, will succeed. They hope they'll thank me and it'll be a legacy that I have to pass down to my children. My goal when, 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 when I, when my publisher asked, what's your goal? My goal was that every law student, before they get a law school, reads my book because it'll make their, them better no matter what kind of law firm job. That was my number one goal. I haven't even shared that out loud, Bill. But, mm. it, it, but that's, if, if you have this mindset, good things come. The more, you know, yeah. the cliche as it is, the more you give, the more you receive. Mm. And that's, that's, I mean, I could go on and on on that, but it's that, interesting that's that, that someone as successful as you it, one, one insecurity I've always had, you know, what will, one of my top insecurities is my age. That's something I go to bed at night feeling like I'm not, I'm not worthy. Uh, that, that's a whole other story. But another one is that learning is unproductive. And yet I am a voracious learn. I, I, I do any course I possibly can get my hands on seminars. I've been to like four Tony Robbins events, four uh, high performance academies, I've hired Grant Cardone for coaching. I've done all this crazy stuff, agency, universe, all this crazy stuff. And I, but it's funny how on the opposite side of your insecurities, usually the opposite is true. And it's interesting to see how successful you are that you find sitting at an event and taking notes as productive because a lot of people look at that as airy fairy. Oh, that's not work. But the problem is, if you always focus on the work and you don't focus and you don't allow yourself to learn new ideas, you'll just repeat insanity. And what we started doing in our company is activity inventories where everyone has to document what do they do on a daily basis and they have to highlight in red the things they hate and the things that they're, that they're really, really good at. They have to highlight in green so that we know they're, they're you know, things they want to do more of. Um, so let, let's transition. The, 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 the point I wanted to say is that it's so cool to hear you label self-development and learning as a high value task um, versus a airy fairy time waster. Um, it's just really cool to hear. So courage is something that, Mike, like okay, the, the advertising budget you have, all right, the, the things, let's try and get, let's try and get to the raw root of this because you know, I, I've told you the mastermind I'm in with Mike Mogul, you know, I, I, I asked him, uh, this is early Monday this week. I was like, Mike, how did you detach your relationship from money? Like he spent $200,000 on, on a, on a bar tab at his event, right. For, for an open bar. Right. And you know, he spends $200,000 sending cut code knives to his, to his clients. And, and, and it, 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 he believes it's going to come back. And and what he told me is that there's no competition in business for the business owner or entrepreneur who can stomach gut-wrenching investments that require full faith. So 
I, I thought that was such an interesting takeaway and you're way bigger than, than where Mike's at. So wh where does courage play in this? Cause you can learn all the information in the world, but at some point you have to make a gut wrenching call, at least in the beginning. So I don't, you know what? It's a great question, Bill. I, I've never thought of myself as being courageous. I don't think in those terms. I do think about risk and maybe that's the same thing and I haven't, thought about it. So maybe risk and courage are the same things. Um, you know, when I first went out on TV, as, uh, as you'll learn when you, when you read the book, I did it out of necessity. So I had about 40 staff. I had just been cut off from the big guy in town who was referring me all my cases. And I had a choice. I was either going to uh, shrink my firm back down to five, 10 people and still make a nice living, but not start killing it or I was going to compete with the six, seven, eight people on TV and try to compete. And lots of things came into my mind, but I bet on myself and I bet on the fact that I knew in the long run I would win. And I didn't have millions of dollars at that point to put into an advertising budget. Um, I, I don't remember our exact budget. I think it was around a half a million dollars for the year to commit to TV to see if it was going to work. And that was risky. Um, but it, it, I was betting on myself. And, and you know, I intend... Do you in, remember with, the moment, the exact moment, Mike, where you signed on the dotted line, committed $500,000? What, what yes. happened? Because that moment is something a lot of people run from. It wasn't that hard because I knew that I was, I knew my whole life I was, I was successful to that point. I had done it on my own. My dad died when I was in law school. I had no backing and it was all on my back. And wow. I, I really didn't have a choice. And I just, I am, uh, uh, you know, I like to think big. I still think big. And I said, let's go for it. And if I lose all my money and I have to start back from scratch, I'll be okay. I'll figure something else out. And that's kind of how I take it. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, offered investments for other businesses every day. Um, and my COO, John, always says to me, Michael, your best investment is this law firm. So rather than giving this guy a million dollars to do this business and hope to get 10, 20, 30%, put that money back in your business and bet on yourself because you're great at what you do. Mm. And so I do that and I'm, I'm doing it as we speak. I mean, I'm, I'm increasing my advertising budget because COVID took a hit. We took a hit on our intake because nobody was driving and I do mostly auto truck motorcycle accidents. So I'm trying to get back to my goals. I'm trying, I'm wondering in the next, in the second half of this year, if I could get back and make up the, the losses of cases. Um, and it's, it's a risk because I might not because I don't know where that point of diminishing returns is. So we're, we're testing it right now. I'm giving my media buyer, you know, an extra twenty five fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a week to advertise more, to get more cases. It may be a failure, but I'm taking a chance and I'm experimenting. You definitely need to experiment. Um, you need to trust yourself. And I guess it's courageous. I don't look at it that way. Um, it's sometimes risky. Um, but again, I'm betting on me. I'm not betting on some stranger. So, that's so it's the a way funny. I it's think. a it's a funny thing that I uh, learned from Dan Sullivan is fear is wetting your pants. Uh, courage is doing what you set out to do with wet pants. And the funny thing is, courage is actually a negative emotion. Oh, um, you know, courage. Courage is a neg How is that negative? Yeah, courage doesn't feel good. Courage is, um, courage isn't uh, isn't confidence. It's it's different. It breeds confidence. They've done brain studies on this. The feeling of courage, okay, the, in the moments leading up to the courageous move, it's a negative emotion. It's not labeled as a positive emotion huh. until after the call is made, and after the call is made, there's no match in brain scans to the bliss that a human being feels after the courageous decision has been made because you're out of uncertainty and you're into a world of, I must make this work. I, I, there is, the ships have been burned, right? The ships have been burned 
and there is absolutely no choice. And so it's so interesting to me that you keep coming back to this belief in yourself. Belief in yourself was your answer to why did you commit $500,000 in a year to advertising when, you know, you didn't really have, you said you have to. That's funny to me because you didn't have to. You, there's so many lawyers who never do that. It was the faith in yourself that I got this. I'm going to pull this off. And, and you believe that. So super inspirational. I guess the, the question then next is like, how do you develop that faith in yourself? Okay. So great questions. I mean, I've spent, you know, had a lot of years of therapy, not embarrassed to say. Yeah, me that too. I, that, 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 you know, that have helped me understand myself better. And, you know, the book touches on two or three traumas I've had in my life, but there's been more. And I'm still standing and I'm good. And um, I've fallen down way more times than I talk about in the book because the book wasn't supposed to be about my personal life. It was supposed to teach lawyers how to get better. But I thought that two or three or four of the examples would show, you know, fireproof. We had a fire. My building burned down. I, I was getting my business from one dude and he, he fired me in one night. So I went down, lost 70% of my business overnight. You know, dad dying in law school, parents getting divorced when I was 12 and, and getting bullied in high school, um, threatened to be beaten up every day um, and on. And, and, and here I am and I'm, I'm, I'm you know, still standing. Um, and so I realized through the therapeutic process, through reading lots of books about self improvement and self help, that uh, I'm good and I'm gonna be okay. And I'm pretty smart, I'm gonna make good decisions and I'm gonna fall and certain things aren't gonna always um, go my way. But I have a, I do, I don't, I think it's innate that I, I fall often and I get right back up real quick and I don't let things beat me down. I don't fall into depression. I don't stay in bed all day. Um, I, 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 some days if something real bad happens, you know, I give myself a good half hour, an hour to be pissed about it and spin about it. And I talk to myself and I talk to that 12 year old, 14 year old boy inside of me and say, dude, we got this, let's go. And we yeah. get back up and we get back on that bike and we keep riding after we skin our knee. And yeah. that's been my life. That's been my whole life. And I don't have real good explanation as to the why what part of this book is to be as inspirational in the fact that bad shit's going to happen to everybody yeah. and how are you going to deal with it? I have a very good friend. I've never said this out loud either, Bill. And I, and I'm not going to say his name obviously, but you know, he was uh, in the financial services business. He had a major, major loss. And he says, I can't deal with that type of loss anymore. Now he's working, you know, for a bank, not uh, taking risks anymore. And it, and it kind of beat him down. Hmm. And right, you know people like that. Mm. And, and I feel that, so I have something different. Other people have something different. Some people don't. You need that safety. Some people, listen, I have lawyers who work for me who just want a paycheck. They want to work a good 40, 50, 60 hours work. Give me it all. But they're happy with their salary. They're not trying to bring in cases. They don't need more than a, call it $100,000 a year. They don't have that drive to mm -hmm. kill it, to win, every, you know, they have a drive to win, but not to like keep Spanning growing up. and building. I love building stuff. Mm -hmm. I loved Tinker Toys when I was a kid. I loved Lego when I was a kid. I loved puzzles when I kid. I still love building stuff. I yep. love helping people build their businesses. I don't want any yep. money from it. I just love helping yep. and build. I like seeing things build. Not everybody has that. Yeah. And there's lawyers who aren't going to read this book, who would read the first chapter and say, screw this. Yep. Um, who don't, who don't have that. I, I don't think you could fake that. I don't think they can change. Certain lawyers can't change from that. Yep. The lesson there is if you're, you know, confidence is built through adversity and what you've pulled off and what you've been through. And there's two ways to handle adversity. Number one is like you have to make you stronger, faster, smarter, sharper, right? The other way is to avoid the burn again. Um, and the interesting thing is with my family, you know, my dad, um, he got burnt and he didn't, he didn't 
ever bounced back. He's one helper employee. Um, he had a $2 million paving business. Um, we were labeled as the wealthy family um, when we were growing up, uh, even though we had tons of debt. And that's another story. But, um, but he put his tail between his legs and, and you know, he's never bounced back fully. Um, and it's in my, so it's funny that painful experiences like that can actually create your biggest motivators. And, and the interesting thing is you probably have reference experiences from people you grew up with who, who did give up or who did accept complacency and, and your motivation perhaps is, is to turn that on its head and to not become that. Um, so a real quick point for me, um, one of my biggest insecurities, uh, another one of them is that I will be the crazy guy. I'll, I'll end up 60, 70 years old and I'll, and I'll die the guy with all these big ideas, the visionary guy that had all these ideas, but couldn't figure out managing a team, couldn't figure out scaling, couldn't figure out systems, couldn't figure out growth communication and dies the guy with all these ideas. Like, you know, uh, yeah, I, I don't mean to call it my dad, but I mean, you know, in, unless he gets his operational organizational thinking together, you know, that's who he is right now. He has all these ideas, how he's going to start a rock band and do all these crazy things. And um, I don't want to end up like that. So I'm driven by this. It, I think it's good to have a dark side of motivation. As Kobe Bryant's coach, Tim Grover says, it's good to have a dark side. It's, it's okay to want to prove something to people um, as long as you're aware of, of that. So like right now, the reason I, I, I didn't reach out to people like you two years ago, because I didn't think I was worthy. And now that I have a business, I think now I'm worthy. That shows I have low self-esteem and I need some external thing to prove that I'm worthy to reach out to Mike Morse. I, I waited on that for two years because I didn't think I was worthy, but now I own that. And at least I can be open and not lie to myself at night that, I am trying to prove something for a little bit yeah. and it's no, no, okay. that's the really uh, smart thinking. And the interesting point is, you know, I, I think I've always curious, you know, how many people follow in their parents' footsteps? You know, I did. Um, you didn't, you looked at your dad and said, I want to do the opposite. I don't like this. What's happening here. I want to be the complete opposite. So what is that in you? How did you realize that you didn't want to do that? Yeah. And, I, and, and, and that's, that's uh... bankruptcy. Yeah. We went bankrupt and, <laughs> and everything our all, everything got repossessed. So, so it's interesting. The so scar... that'll scare the shit out of you to, uh, to say, I don't want that. I didn't know that part of your story, but that's, yeah, yeah that's, that's enough. And I think a lot of, you know, people, I've looked at this from a divorced angle, right? How, you know, kids coming from divorced parents, are they better off, worse off? Are they, go-getters, are they not, um, you know, are they likely to get divorced? Are they likely to stay married? How are their kids? Blah, blah. And I, I, I look at that. Both my parents were married three times, right? I had bad step-parents. I had abusive step-parents. And, you know, when I joke with my mom and I rib her for bad decisions she made 35 years ago, she'll say, Michael, those decisions, those mistakes I made, my mom, have made you what you are today. You having to deal with bullying, you having to deal with me making bad decisions, you having to deal with your dad dying when you were 22. Had your dad been alive, had you not been bullied, had we still been married, do you think you'd be as successful as you are? No way. So, I mean, I, I look yeah. at those things. It's not, you know, I, I looked at those two things through lots of therapy and having some, some ability. I, I, I'm not... I didn't make conscious decisions. I didn't realize half this shit until I was in my forties. Mm. You know, you know, I remember when the first time somebody suggested some of this stuff, it was like, what? Like I didn't buy it. And as I get older, I, I'm starting to own it. And, and you know, it's good to own this stuff. This is, this kind of conversation is cathartic because you do move on and, and do better things and, and help people to think about, you know, why they're where they're at. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think a lot of us are, you know, when you finally have kids, Bill, if you're blessed to have kids one day, you know, you're going to take the good from your dad and be a good dad, but you're also going to say, I didn't like this and I'm going to be better. Mm. So, you know, kids who had parents who were workaholics, generally my friends aren't workaholics as, as they have kids. They tend, they tend to pull it back and spend more time with their kids because they didn't like that their dad worked mm. till 10 o'clock at night, things like that. So they, they shift. 
I also have friends who actually do the exact same things their parents do, which is sad because they didn't learn. You are learning from, from your dad's mistakes and that says something about you. The people who don't and they're just like their dads, as dysfunctional as them, they didn't learn and they don't see a problem with it. I'm sure you have friends like that too. Oh yeah. And, uh, and I think, you know, the self-awareness that we're talking about, right? That's what we're talking about is self-awareness helps growing a law practice. Yeah. And, and so many lawyers I talk to just want to be lawyers. Don't want to talk about the touchy feely stuff we're talking about. Don't want to go to therapy. Don't want to worry about reading and going to seminars and getting better. They want their next divorce case. They -hmm. want their next bankruptcy case. They want their next criminal case. They want their next truck case and they want to make money. And then they want the next case and then they want the next case. And then they want the next case. Before you know it, they're 60 or 70 years old. They don't have a ton to show. They're not all that happy. And I saw that writing on the wall way back then. And that's not how I am. So I chose to do different. And when I took my eye off the money ball, uh, it just, it came faster. It came easier. It came, it, it was more fun. Um, when you're so dialed into making every single penny and cutting corners and not risking money for advertising and not risking being the man in the arena because you're afraid that people are going to throw stones at you and say bad shit about you on, on social media, well, you're, you're in a straitjacket at that point and you can't move. Mm. So, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not in a straitjacket. I get, I get people taking shots at me all the time because, um, you know, people want to knock the king down and yep. uh, all the time. And, and, you know, you're going to, the faster you, when you have 30, 40, 50 employees, um, I mean, talk to your friend, Mike, Michael Mogill about it. I mean, he's, he, he's got one of the best shops in town and, and he's starting to, I think he's, I see some of the stuff, he's starting to feel some heat and some competition and some people saying things and the more successful you are, that happens. And yep. he's just got to stay laser focused because he's doing a fantastic job. I look at a website, I see one of his videos on it. I say, that's a crisp video. That's amazing. Um, mm-hmm. And so, you know, I think we all, the, big, the bigger we get, the better we get, the more successful we get. We have to be prepared for criticism and jealous people and people taking shots and people trying to take over our business and people trying to knock us off that wall. And we have to see it coming and say, Oh, that's what that was. Okay. Mm. And, and keep pushing forward. So if there's three takeaways here before we sign off and show, show Mike's book again. Uh, number one is self-awareness. I mean, listen to this. If you, if you're still watching this video, just, Listen to Mike's self-awareness here. Uh, it's almost like he's completely shattered his ego. The next one is, uh, you know, to always bank on yourself, to, to put that faith in yourself uh, based on everything you've been through to get here. Uh, and another big takeaway is prepare for arrows in the back, like proactively. Um, before we uh, show them your book again, Mike, funny little thing is uh, Steve Jobs is famous for when he was trying to innovate uh, with the Mac team uh, in, in Apple, he was getting a lot of pushback within Apple's main offices because people didn't want change because they were all wrapped up in their day to day. So what he did was he got the entire Mac innovation team in a separate building and he put a pirate flag on top of it. And what that signified was if you want to do something different, you have to shield out all of the noise and that pirate flag signified uh, we are expecting people to call us the rebels, right? And that's how he innovated all of his best things for Apple was with a pirate flag on top of a building uh, and all the innovators in a separate building. And Mike has yeah. successfully done that to shield out the naysayers. So uh, I, thought, I thought that really related well. So Mike, why don't you show everyone your book again? Because uh, <laughs> we, we ended up going super in depth into psychology. So Fireproof is Mike's book. Now, this is going to show you a little bit of the psychology side, uh, but more importantly, the systemization side uh, on how it's basically traction for law firms uh, from the perspective of, I always have the book Traction near me everywhere I go um, because I always refer back to it. Um, But basically, it's a way for you to get a grip on your law firm uh, from the perspective of building in a jumbotron, like a big uh, numbers dashboard that everyone on the team feels committed to. Uh, and what else are they going to learn if they get the book? Well, the jumbotron is, is one of the people's favorite uh, parts 
but you know, it's, it's talking, we talk in the legal sense about visionary and integrator and the importance that that changed my life. You know, once I realized that I was a visionary, I wasn't good at doing the day to day. I needed a number two integrator. You know, all those ideas, Bill, that you mentioned 20 minutes ago, you're not going to die with six. You're not going to die with all those ideas because you probably have a really good integrator and you come up with that idea, you toss it over your shoulder, your integrator, and that person's going to get it done. So I have that in my practice. Uh, we talk a whole chapter on hiring, firing, and paying innovatively, differently than most law firms. We use testing. We uh, do lots of different things. The legal jumbotron, run your business like you run your biggest case. Mm. A lot of lawyers run their business running around like we talked about. We talk about running your business. You know, every lawyer has that big case that's going to you know, make them a lot of money. I don't care what practice area you're in. And you plan for it and you, you set goals and you set to do's and you set tasks and you look at it every day. But lawyers don't do that for their biggest case, which is their business. Mm. So we tell them to pull back and, and we train them how to do that. And the last chapter, which is my favorite, we call it Cherry Garcia Beats Vanilla, which all the legal ads that all you, your friends out there are running, in my opinion, are vanilla. They're just a commodity. They're kind of, not kind of, they're boring, but they're herd mentality. Oh, if he's doing it and he's getting cases, I'm going to do the same thing. Well, guess what? I felt that way too. And it doesn't work. So mm. I said, I'm going to be Cherry Garcia. I'm going to be flavorful. I'm going to have those chocolate chips and those cherries and I'm going to stand out. So my ads are special and memorable and, and different like Cherry Garcia and people remember them and they remember my number. And, uh, and that's, I love, I, if I wasn't doing what I'm doing, I'd be, I'd be in branding and, and marketing. And cause that, is so fun for me uh, to, to have, put an ad out there and have people come up to me. Like we had an ad a few years back where we joked. Uh, my mom one day at dinner says to me, um, Michael, I'm getting recognized everywhere because of your commercials. I was at Eastern Market and somebody gave me a free loaf of bread and I'm at this store and they're doing this. So we did a commercial called Mike's Mom. And, uh, or no, no, I'm sorry. It was called Sue's Son. And uh, everybody, we, my mom and I are in a restaurant. Everybody's come up to me and says, oh, I know you. You're Sue's son. So, so people in the streets literally come up to me now, three, four years after we ran that ad and said, oh, you're Sue's son. That's so freaking cool and fun. It has nothing to do with handling auto accident cases. But it's like it's showing how, how uh, important, good, smart advertising is. Um, so anyway, that's my favorite part. That's my favorite. One of my probably my sec first favorite chapter. Um, and that creative part of it. So that's what they're going to learn. Hopefully they'll like it. Hopefully they'll share it with their friends and their staff. I have law firms buying 20, 30, 40 coffee, copies for their entire staff, which makes me feel really good. And uh, so we've had 80, 85 five-star reviews in two weeks. Um, wow. So yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled. Awesome. So make sure you guys pick up Mike Morse's book and you're going to go to Amazon and just type in Fireproof Mike Morse, M-O-R-S-E, and you can pick up that book, uh, or we'll put a link in the description of the video, whichever's, uh, whatever ends up happening with uh, the doers of the video. So thank, uh, you. thank you so much, Mike, for your time and for your vulnerability and openness. And uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. Where can everyone follow up with you outside of the book, Mike? Our website is 855mikewins.com. Um, we have a fun and interesting podcast called Open Mic on YouTube, and we're on all the listening podcast channels on iTunes and everything. We have over 65 episodes. We're spending a lot of energy on wrongful convictions right now in the, our screwed up criminal justice system, so I'm spending a lot of energy and time on that, but you can get that through, uh, I think it's openmicpodcast.com or just go to my website. You'll find it. Follow me on social media. Feel free to email me if you have any questions, mike at 855 mikewins.com. I'm happy to hop on calls with any of your clients, anybody listening to your show, Bill, because I have a passion for this. I love giving back. Thank you for interviewing me today. I've never had an interview like this. I've never gone in the weeds like this. Uh, hopefully I didn't say anything too stupid um, or, or telling myself too much, which could have happened, but I, I, you know, at this point in my career, I don't give a shit anymore. And, um, and if it helps people, great. And if people want to make fun of me, go for it. 
free advertising. So yes. thank you everyone. Make sure you subscribe to the SMB team YouTube channel. If you want to get real time updates when we release more stuff, stay great. And remember to be the most positive solution oriented attorney in your market to the point where you get some arrows in the back. Stay tuned for the next episode. Stay great. Stay great.